Aloha, everybody. Happy birthday to my mom. How nice of you. I will pass that on to her. She turns 86 tomorrow on the 19th of July. So uh, thank you for that. We are in Nahum chapter 2. We're trying this with two different cameras. So let's give it a shot and see how far we go. Uh, and let's open up in a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time. Father, as we look at your word now and we understand the significance of a vision that includes judgment... Uh, we would just like to say that humbles us. We are in the New Testament world of the covenant of Jesus Christ and how thankful we are. Uh, but you are the same God and you look at sin and you tell us clearly in both Old and New Testaments that you judge it. Uh, people do not like to hear these kind of messages because they are truth and strong and many are challenged by it and some run from it. But if we're gonna to run today, Lord, may we run only to the cross and may we find ourselves once again saying, thank you for the amazing grace that though we are worthy of judgment, you have set us free through the blood of the lamb. Give us the strength for everyday living. Give us the strength to live holy lives, righteous lives for you. And as a result of it all, God, may you be honored through what you do in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Nahum chapter two. Now we had opened the book last week and we'll do the, uh, I hope to do the entirety of this chapter uh, this morning. And as we do, we're, we're dropping in, kind of parachuting in to the vision Nahum was given by God of something that's going to happen to Nineveh. And just to refresh you, the the story of Jonah or the accounts of Jonah coming to Nineveh very regretfully, initially, reluctantly, uh, had already taken place and God spared Nineveh. Remember, Jonah was just saying, wipe them out. You're going to be wiped out. And he expected it to happen, but they repented, which is always the goal when you teach about judgment or any kind of prophecy, the goal is not to see people burn. The goal is to see people repent and be right with God. And so that's what happened in Jonah's story. This is a, some 100 years later, and the people of Nineveh and Assyria, it was the capital of Assyria, they uh, rejected God again. They returned to their own ways. And uh, this time God sends the prophet Nahum, or will send this vision that we're reading about, this prophecy, and uh, judgment will come. He describes what's going to happen. It is, uh, it is dramatic, it is visual, uh, it is truth, and it is the way that God instructed Nahum to record it. So we're coming into this second chapter, and Nahum will describe what God is going to do, but he'll describe the condition of Nineveh. And remember, they were the strongest force in that known part of the earth at that time, and they were prideful in it. No one could take on them. And they would send a messenger out uh, that would say, surrender, and people would surrender, and they would, they would know the strength of Nineveh. So with some of that in mind, Remember, you're dropping into a vision here to Nahum, describing what will happen to them. So verse one in the theme of this destruction of Nineveh, <coughs> he says, he who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks. Fortify your power mightily. You're, you're going to deal with your years of sin. You're going to be dealt with. And you go ahead and try. And these were some of the things that they will be saying. Man the fort because God would allow an army to come in to take them. Man the fort. Do what we always do. Strengthen your flanks. But you'll see that it won't matter. The strongest force against the forces of God. By the way, we'll come to it here in about uh, 11 12 verses, but some have, have uh, said this verse 13, so I should, actually I'm not going to refer to it yet because you'll 
leave me, you'll go to 13, you won't hear a thing I say. So there's nothing interesting in verse 13, just ignore it. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily, and here's why. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob. The Assyrians had hauled the people of Israel away. And this is what's going to happen to them in this future judgment. The Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. When they captured the Israelites and they captured the people of God, they destroyed the land. And uh, the interesting term, the emptiers have come. They emptied them of everything and they hauled them away. And so he says there's coming a time the Lord is uh, will restore the people of Israel, restore Jacob and the excellence of Israel. God loves Israel and uh, God cares for Israel and we are told that Israel doesn't get a pass for its sin. It must come under Christ like everybody uh, does as well. But it is clear in scripture that they are God's chosen people. We are to stand with Israel. Doesn't mean they make every decision right because they're sinful people like we are sinful people. But God has a plan in his restoration of Israel. And uh, you're going to hear some more about that next week. But it is a powerful God that is coming to restore his people. So the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob and like that, the excellence of Israel for all that the emptiers have emptied them out. They've emptied them out and they hauled them away and they've ruined their vine branches. Now look at this picture uh, too, as you hear a description of Nineveh, and especially in their mighty uh, warrior sense. It says the shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. And you can kind of get the picture of battle ready and by this point battle weary men and blood on the shields. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets and they jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. That was part of Nineveh's might. That was part of their army. They used chariots and uh, they were very effective in their destruction. So once again, they will return to what they know, their fighting habits and their traditions, and they will be made red when the armies that God sends comes for judgment. And they will clamor in the streets with their flaming torches. And they will prepare, uh, and their spears will be brandished, but they will rage in the streets. And the idea is everything that they do won't do any good because God's judgment will be so thorough. And, and it was, as we look in history, it was. And they were literally washed away. They got so used to winning so many battles when this judgment came. They, uh, you know, fought a little bit here, or not a little bit, they fought, you know, a couple different battles, and then they thought they had it, they got drunk, and they were taken out and uh, vanished, so you wouldn't even hear their names anymore. So interesting, kind of, as we, again, look at that image of being parachuted in, you see the clamoring, you see what they're so used to doing, you see people say, well, I'll just take these guys on like we've taken all the other guys on, and it'll be okay, except it isn't. It says in the next part, they run like lightning. They run fast. And he remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. None of them had great leaders and kings and nobles. God remembers them. And now they're not so great. What are they doing? They're stumbling. Part of the drunkard position or uh, position they were in but their defense just kind of has them scrambling in the streets and stumbling. They make haste to her walls, the fortified walls of Nineveh. And the defense is prepared. They're ready to try and stop this judgment, these armies that will come. But the gates of the rivers are opened. And that's the idea of them eventually just being completely washed away by the armies 
some eventual flooding that takes place as well. The gates of the rivers are open and the palace, look at this description, this is New King James. And the palace, the place of royalty, do you see the word? Dissolved. Just like you take some water and a sand castle at the beach and you pour it over and it just dissolves back into flat sand. You don't stand up against the judgment of God is the idea. The mightiest armies on earth, the mightiest kingdoms on earth at the time, and they think because of their history, they'll stop this as they've done before, and their very palace is dissolved. It is decreed. It is decreed. It's gonna happen, in other words. She shall be led away captive. I find that one interesting because as you look through Old Testament history, and all the captives, uh, captivities of Israel, they are led away. They are emptied. Their vines are destroyed and they're led away. She will be led away. Nineveh will be led away. The people of the power, the army, the kings, they should be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. Uh, they'll, they'll be so drunk, destroyed, emptied that their servants will have to lead them out through this destruction. Uh, another reference to the water here. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. So you, you had this mighty city, it was like a pool of water. Someone pulled the drain and it's God. Actually, someone just knocked down the barriers of the pool of water and they're just led away. It just floods out and dissolves. The Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Now they flee away. It even brings us into the cries of the city. And they will be horrible. They were horrible when it happened. Halt, halt, they cry. Stop, stop. But no one turns back. The leaders, the captains of the army are saying, don't run, don't leave, halt, stop. And everyone flees. Now they flee away. No one turns back. Take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure in Nineveh. So the encouragement is get, get it out to the armies that are attacking of wealth of every desirable prize and they tell us uh, in research that um, you, when they, you go to that place or when that um, follow-up was done in that area, there was no gold, there was no silver. Usually there is. After an event like that, it was all taken away, just as scripture says. Of wealth of every desirable prize. Now look at verse uh, 10. This is, she is empty, desolate, and waste. That's not gonna impact you and I like it would if we were around back then. The most mightiest place on earth with palaces and power and evil and strength uncomparable is now described after God deals with Nineveh is now described as empty, desolate and waste. The heart melts, look at the people here. The heart melts. The knees shake. That's a reference to fear of the Almighty. You think you're so tough until you see God and God's judgment and the knees shake. The heart just melts away. Much pain is in every side. There's no escaping this judgment is the idea. And all their faces are drained of color. Do you see that picture? It's hard to look at. But all the evil they've done, all the power they have is suddenly removed like breaking down a wall and emptying a pool of water. They're drained, they're fearful, they're shaking. Their faces are drained of color. One of the interesting things about Nineveh, they were known for their lion's den and their symbol was actually a lion of strength. The symbol of strength was a lion. So notice how that's dealt with. Where is the dwelling of the lion? This is after the destruction. 
Where is the dwelling of the lion? That's like saying, where's your strength? Where's your symbol? Where's your power? Where's your kitty cats that you were so proud of? It's almost a, a blow or a, just a strong reminder that, that says you're nothing before God. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions that you were so well known for? Where the lion walked and the lioness and lion's cub and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs killed his lioness, filled his cage with prey, and his dens with flesh. All that power is gone. All of it is gone. We're down to verse 13. You ready? Someone has called these next eight words the most powerful, fearful words in the Bible. I had not heard that before. Here it is. This is God speaking. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. Behold, I am against you. Friends, those are words you never want to hear. When God comes to set right the evil that has been done in our world, no matter what politician or great authority or strength or leader of nation, or city, they will not want to hear these words. People play with God and mock God. And I'm not going to describe it, but I saw something this week of uh, of a song about coming after children, celebrating coming after children in an evil way. And I just, I didn't listen to it. I just saw the words, and it was enough. And I thought. Only for a season. Every child that's been violated, every evil that's been done on this earth, unless they repent and come before our Lord Jesus in humility and contrite heart, they will hear these words, I am against you. Because God is against evil. The Assyrians were known for their evil through the years and God is absolutely against it. And he will make the wrong right. Right now, we typically say right is wrong in our society. And it is in many places. But God is not missing anything. And as we're reading of this judgment, can I remind you that God postponed this judgment at least a century, if not more? After Jonah and they repented, he postponed this judgment, but they went back and so now the words are said, I am against you, Nineveh, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots. Remember, their strength holds again, their strongholds. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lives. You, you, brag about your chariots, you brag about your lions and the symbol of strength. Here's what I'm going to do to your chariots. They'll be in smoke. And the sword will pierce and devour, kill your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers. Remember, they would just send a messenger out and people would get the message and say, okay, we're not messing with the Assyrians. And the voice of your messenger shall be heard no more. It's thorough judgment. It's complete judgment. And when it is done, it will be complete in the sense that there is no more Nineveh. And certainly that's the case. There is no more Assyria. Even the voices of your messengers will be no more. So I, I take no pleasure in reading or studying or preaching chapters like this. I do it because we're commanded to do it. It's in our recorded scripture. So we work our way through the Bible and you come through minor prophets, major prophets, and other passages of judgment. There's nothing fun about this to think of the judgment that's coming. But what I always have to do in my own personal application, and we have to do this as a church, 
we have to remember that as evil and as horrible as they were, the human sacrifices, the infant sacrifices, whatever the sin, God did not miss any of it. And we live in a day and age and we ask these questions, God, why would you allow this to happen in our communities, in our world? Why would you allow evil to go on? And the answer is simply that he is a patient, gracious God. And he's been gracious in every one of our lives. And he continues to be. But make no mistake about it, just as a minor prophet of old warned, so the Holy Spirit warns us. Evil and sin is a place we don't want to be. And God will judge it. And yes, right now, as we stand before the grace of God, we still have the opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus, forgive me. You hung on the cross in my place. There is nothing I could do good enough or routinely enough to make myself right before God. It's only because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. Because he is a God who will judge, but in his love, he sent his son to be that perfect sacrifice. This morning, I'd like to close our service just in a slightly different way and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to watch with me a, a three-minute clip. It'll be on the screen here as Gary sets it up. And it's from a great Bible teacher many of you are aware of um, from Scotland and uh, ministers in Ohio, Alistair Begg. And uh, he's just a, a great man with the Word of God. This is only a three-minute portion of a, a message he taught. But when we think of a judgment passage like this, and you hear his description uh, at Golgotha, I want you to uh, soak it in a little more of what Christ has done for us. Gary, when you're ready. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believe, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. And think about the thief on the cross. I oh, want an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him. How did that shake out for you? Because you were, you, were, you, were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You'd never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we're, uh, did, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. There you go, get the supervisor in here. So, we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are, you, are, you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? The guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy is just staring. And eventually in frustration he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. Now, now that's the, that is the only answer. That is the only answer. And if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy. 
while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me. And as soon as you go there, it will lead you either to abject despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And it is only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance of the pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God that just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Luther said most of your Christian life is outside of you. In this sense, that we know that we're not saved by good works. We're not saved as a result of our professions, but we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. A powerful reminder. I try and take my sin and say, God, I'll just try and do better. And I'll, I'll be better at attending church and reading my Bible and all of that. None of it saves you. The man on the middle cross saves us. And we should be extremely thankful because we will avoid what we just read out of Nahum 2 as a result of Jesus Christ. Let's bow and thank him for that, shall we? We're humbled by your word. We're humbled by the reminders this morning. Although you call us and we live a, a life, we desire to live a life righteous before you by the power of your spirit, which you provide, even in that you provide it, we realize our failures, but we don't use them as excuses, God. Because you died on that middle cross, Lord Jesus, you washed away our sin, but you also gave us the power to live for you, to break everything that would pull us back into despair and to sin. And so because of that, we thank you. We turn only to you. There's nothing we could say or do that would justify us. And so we thank you. There's an area this morning in your life you need to turn over to this Jesus that we serve. I would encourage you to do it now. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, you just heard that's what it takes to come to heaven and receive eternal life and forgiveness of sin. If you've never done that, invite Jesus into your heart now by simply saying, Lord, I am a sinner. You know it well. You see my heart like you saw the hearts of the people of Nineveh. I confess my sin. I repent of it, and I turn to you for my forgiveness. your work amongst us, Spirit of God, we pray. Yeah. Mm -hmm.